So welcome everybody. Um, wow, uh, I feel honored to do the keynote on this awesome conference in an awesome city with an unpronounceable name uh, and an awesome audience. So a keynote is supposed to uh, set the context or the general topic or the tone of a conference, right? And when it comes to big established conferences, you will oftentimes have very advanced, technical, detailed topics like Mats talking about the next embedded Ruby VM, right? Something like that. Um, but looking at our schedule today and tomorrow, we will, we will see some quite advanced, really technical talks. So when I talk to the organizers, we decided to try something else here and have a keynote which is more about open source and especially getting newcomers uh, to the, on board with the Ruby community and especially the Ruby open source community. So this talk will be about why you should get involved in open source and if you do, how you will benefit from that. And if you already do open source, why you should probably do way more of that, right? And if you already do lots of open source, why and how to encourage others to do that too? So please, everybody, raise your hands if you are involved in an open source project. Okay, that's quite a lot. Please, everybody, raise your hands if you're not involved in an open source project. Okay, guys. So this talk is for you. <laughs> so who am I? Um, my name is Sven Fuchs. Um, I led the Ruby I18N project and today I'm mostly involved with the Travis CI project uh, which um, Josh will talk about later. Uh, you might have seen my name just because it's in every new created Rails application in a file in the config folder somewhere deep down there. Uh, it links to uh, a project of mine. I'm also on various lists. For example, this is Railas IM. It's a South American project, I think. I could be wrong. Uh, I personally couldn't care less about these kind of ranking sites. Uh, I think this is just obviously plain wrong to put me be between David Heinmeier Hansen and Yehuda Katz. Um, but on the other hand, actually my former boss loved this kind of stuff. And he actually was willing to pay me more uh, because of these ranking sites, right? When I was at Frozen Rails the other day, a few weeks ago, someone showed me this picture from there office wall. I'm not sure you can, you can recognize those guys, but for example, this is David Heinmeier Hansen. This is Yehuda Katz. Here's actually Roy T. Fielding. And this guy over here is Mats. And then what the fuck, I recognize my own picture here. <laughs> They've just put all the, their programming, programming heroes up there, right? Um, and this, kind, this stuff is ki still like mind-boggling to me. I feel like I do, do not deserve that. I feel there should be someone else on that wall, right? Uh, and I definitely shouldn't be on those list ranks between, um, yeah, in these places. So, but why do I tell you that? Because it's actually really useful to be there. Um, and because you guys are most probably way smarter than I am. And because of that, if I can do this stuff, you can do that easily. As a matter of fact, I did not even do this in the sense that I aimed to go to be there in any way, right? I haven't set a goal like, oh, I want to be on that list. It actually rather happened to me. <clears throat> So how did I get into that position? I will tell you four stories about things that literally happened to me, and I will then point out a few things that I believe are really useful to you, to your team, 
and basically everyone who does not want to miss out on all those amazing opportunities. So the first story is, in 2006, I was a really unhappy freelancer who was stuck on bad clients and boring projects, and I really wanted to try something new, right? So I looked at Ruby and Rails, and I immediately fell in love with that. And because I had serious issues with I18N work in my uh, PHP and Java projects at that time, I really wondered how would that work in Rails, right? So I looked around, and I found Globalize, and I was just amazed about how, how this thing worked, right? Uh, I played around with it for a while, and I finally decided, why not write a blog post about that? I would just write, okay, I'm a super, I'm a Rails newbie, and I, why do I think that this thing is cool, right? And so I did that, and I announced that on the mailing list, and a few days later, the maintainer of Globalize, Joshua Harvey, approached me and told me that this is exactly what the Globalize community needs, because there was no documentation about Globalize at that time, right? Uh, so he actually uh, approached me in person and said, hey man, this is great. Thank you so much for writing this up. Um, and by the way, here are a few mistakes you made. You did get this and this and this wrong and maybe you could correct that, right? And I was like totally mind blown. Without knowing any, anything substantial about Ruby or Rails or this particular plugin, I was suddenly be contacted by someone who was considered a well-known, experienced Ruby programmer at that time, right? So for you guys, this, is, this might not be a, a, a big thing today, is it? But for me at that time, it totally was. And so I am good at organizing and laying out information and getting a high-level overview of something and then structuring all the details in a way that makes sense for a reader or a user, um, and I, I just did that. I simply collected all the information that I could find on the internet about Globalize, and that was a fucking big mess. Like, it was tons of details of outdated information from discussions from mailing lists and IRC logs and all this kind of stuff. And so I structured this, and I thought, hey man, you could write a few blog posts from that, right? And so I did that. I just wrote w about one blog post per month, not even that much. But one year later, I had a tutorial which consisted uh, of eight blog posts and a few extra notes on my blog. And I got quite some traffic from Google from people searching for information about Globalize, right? And again, at that time, I haven't really done much about that. I haven't put much time into it. I just had this little tiny side project where I did something that was fun to me. And I still was not a good Ruby programmer, but suddenly my blog was considered the mo single most comprehensive resource for information about this plugin. And this had a number of consequences. I actually learned about uh, learned a lot of things about Globalize, right? How it works, what its philosophy is, uh, what the trade-offs are, what its weaknesses and strengths are, how it compares to others, and all this stuff. I learned quite a lot about Rails actually doing this kind of thing. I also made good friends with Joshua Harvey and Simon Moore, who were both, um, I, actually they are great developers, but they were like exper considered con experienced developers at that time, which I was not. And also people started approaching me with uh, questions about Globalize through email, through IRC, and like on conferences and everything. And so almost out of nothing, I suddenly was considered a, speciali a specialist about something people care about. So the res recipe for what I'm talking about there is pretty simple. You just pick something that you love, and then you do it. And you publish whatever you come up with, right? And you get feedback on that, and then you repeat. What you get back for this tiny amount of work can be absolutely tremendous. You build up all sorts of skills. You ga gain knowledge. 
you learn to use the tools you need. Um, you get better at communicating to people remotely. You get better at understanding people who think differently from you and all sorts of really valuable skills. And you get in contact with great developers who are really thankful for whatever you're doing there, right? People will know you for something that you've contributed and therefore they know you for something where you excel in. And the cool thing about this is it's not even real work, right? It's just something you love to do and have fun doing. Next example. So this is basically the same story, but in a slightly diff a bigger scale. <clears throat> so in 2007, the R Ruby and Rails community was in a situation where it, we had all those tons of I18N and translation uh, plugins, like there was Getex, there was Globalize One, there was Localize, there was Simple Localization and everything. So it was a ton. And they all did like similar things, but not quite the same. And they all weren't compatible with each other. And the worst thing was that with ever, every single point release of Rails, all of them would break because they were monkey patching Rails like crazy, right? Um, and so Joshua and I, we talked about this and we decided to try and get all those plug-in developers to one table and discuss how, what to do about that. Um, so we would discuss how to extract a common I18N API from all those plugins and get Rails use this API where all the plugins then could build on top of that. That was the idea. And uh, so I was still pretty much a Rails newbie at that time, right? It's one, one year later. And Again, I just did something I was good at. We got all those people to one IRC discussion table, like a virtual table, uh, and I just sent out meeting, uh, meeting agendas before the meeting. And during the meeting, I would moderate the discussion, right, with where we had all those superhero alpha uh, mega programmer guys on one table, so some moderation was, um, useful there. And after the meeting, I would send, simply send out summaries of what we've talked about. And so these discussions took almost half a year. And, but once we've reached a consensus about what the problem was and what possible solutions could look like, it turned out, meanwhile, nobody had time anymore to implement this kind of stuff because one guy was building a house, one guy was building a new business, one guy was having kids and all this kind of stuff. And so I found myself to be the only guy who had all those, all those things, all, all these notes and all this knowledge on his local hard drive and who could implement that. And so I did that. And when we showed this thing to Rates, to Rates Core, uh, and we asked them, all right, this is what we came up with. We believe this would really, would really be helpful for the I18N community. Could you look at that? And could you tell us what we need to improve or change? And they basically looked at my code and merged it right away. And again, I was completely blown away by that. Again, this was not like the result of so some Ruby superhero crafting magical code, right? Uh, and if, if I can do that, you can do that too at any time. So how would you start? As I said, you just pick something. You just pick some project you like. You talk to people. You talk to the, the developers, to the users, to newcomers. And you just start contributing small things and publish them and help out the community this way. So there are lots of small things you can start with. You just go to GitHub, for example, you look through the issues, you pick something, and you just discuss your ideas there. You review pull requests, maybe, or you, maybe you, you try to implement a small feature and send a pull request to the maintainer. This way you will get feedback. You can just start with something very simple, and even if you just fix typos in the code documentation, then people will love you for that, 
right? Each and every improvement will be very welcome, no matter how small it is. Or you could just, if, if you don't dare to touch their code because you don't feel like you're a good enough developer yet, you could just write a few bits of documentation, right? Because if this is a project you like, then you probably have used it a couple of times. And therefore, you can just go ahead and explain that to newbies. You can just write a blog post about it, or you can hang out in IRC channels and, and, and answer questions from newcomers. So there are tons of opportunities um, you can, how you can join a project. If you're a designer, though, you're in the best position ever because you know that open source projects usually lack proper design. They oftentimes don't, even, don't have a logo or anything. They most of the time don't even have any design whatsoever or something we would call a design. Uh, so why not just go ahead and spend a weekend and craft a cool logo and publish that once every two months or something? People, lo people will love you for doing that. You don't need to start with big things. You can just pick some small improvements that you can easily do in your spare time. And again, what you get back for these tiny amounts of works can be, abso can be absolutely amazing. So, if you're a manager, all right, anyway. So around, around the time when I started implementing IATN, I decided to kind of reboot my own life, right? I wanted to get rid of all those boring projects and former clients, and I decided to uh, move to Berlin uh, for a number of reasons, and we just did that, and I wrote a short note about that on my blog. And out of nothing, I got an email from a person who wanted to build up a rates development shop in Berlin uh, and build up a new team for that, and apparently, for some reason, he was under the impression that I am the right person to do that, right? Uh, because he had read on my blog about Globalize, and he used Globalize, and he had read that, I'm, that there's this ongoing effort to get the IATN API into Rails and this kind of stuff. So we met and had a coffee, and I told him what my ideal job would look like, right? I, would t I told him I would like to work on open source projects in my work time, and I would like to earn this and this and this amount of money, and he agreed. And so I started working for him, and he paid me this amount of money, and I worked, and he allowed me to work on IATN and several other open source projects during work time. And later, he actually hired Joshua Harvey to help me implement Globalize 2. So you can easily imagine that this was like the absolute dream position for me, right? I came, just came out of nothing from stupid, boring clients, and now I was hired in Berlin for a good rate and was working on open source uh, projects in my work time. Today, I think this is something which is quite normal, which is a quite normal result that will just happen as soon as you get into contributing to open source regularly and publish whatever you have, right? Um, you just have to make sure that people know about what, you, what you're doing there. So, um, yeah, this is from a blog from the itreedia.com blog, and I just found this interesting. They, say, they also say, uh, the person that is in charge of hiring at the kind of company you really want to work at, so that, that kind of co company where you really want to work at, at, is going to be looking at an applicant's open source contributions as a, as a way to gosh talent. So those companies which really get it and those companies where you really want to work at will look at your open source uh, contributions, right? And then a couple of sentences later they say again, being involved in one or more open source projects makes you a more desirable employee. 
So if you're, if you're a manager and you're running a business or you're in charge of managing a development team, then I highly recommend you consider getting into open source. First of all, make sure that your developers contribute to open source pro projects regularly. They should be used to do that. This is the best training you can ever get for almost all relevant skills, right? And it's free training. You don't pay for that. It's free. Make sure they extract reusable libraries from your code base and publish them as open source gems libraries on the internet. Another thing you can do is organize local developer events. Just offer a room and ask your team to meet with colleagues and friends, and it's cheap, right? Just put out some drinks there and put a beamer on, and those guys will be super happily discussing technical topics and improve the knowledge in your company. I also recommend you consider sponsoring an open source project in a, in a tiny way. You don't have to spend lots of money of that, right? Just give away small donations. Maybe you print a t-shirt for an open source project that you use for your, for your product, or maybe just even stickers, or you sponsor a certain feature uh, that you need for your product, right? Or you sponsor doing a logo for them, or anything like that. And I can guarantee that you will see huge benefits from that. Not only will your code base be uh, much better, in a much better sh shape, because you get free contributions and free quality management from the open source community. You also get way better and way more motivated developers. They will be fucking proud to work for your company when you do that. And so they will be more loyal to your company and tell other people's about, people about that. And so you get better applications and gain credit, uh, technical credit. So if you don't believe me about that, look at what your competitors are doing in this space and why. Last story. Um, I still maintain all those IITNN gems, um, like IITNN and Globalize 3 and all these things, things around that, but I do not actually work on them anymore, um, much anymore. I just because there are other people who picked up this work, this daily work on that, right? They apply the pull requests and they discuss how to actually, whatever, add support for a new database or something like that. And I'm, I'm just being asked for important high-level decisions. And so I, I see their patches and their discussions every day. And I know they're doing a fucking amazing job. I know. I do trust those guys because I have seen their work on my code for years now, right? And on the other hand, I'm being approached by people who want to use these gems and have some problem with that, right? So it happened the other day that a Western European company approached me and said, all right, we have this website and we need to translate it, but there are these and these and these uh, particular small issues to that. and so." our developers aren't able to figure that out. Could you please help us? And I said, no, I don't have any time for that, but I can refer you the single best person for this job in the world. And so I did that, and I, I referred this guy to them. He's a developer from Eastern Europe, right? And, he, and they got in contact, and he would, he would work for them for a very good rate. Uh, that I know for a fact he would never have had dared to ask for. And so both of them were super happy because he got good money and they got someone who would fix their problems in a fraction of the time their own development team would need because they had already tried for two weeks, they couldn't fix it, this guy would come in and fix it in, a, in like, I don't know, maybe a day or something because he knows what's going on. Right? He's an expert in this, in this space. Um, so it's not always about money, right? But it's sometimes it's also about money. And I have no idea how accurate, accurate these numbers are. 
but I found them on a German freelancing portal, and it says that for Ruby and Rails pr projects, the average rate for an average project are around 75 euros this way, this year. But that also means that when you're doing consultant as a specialist and you're considered an expert in this space, you can ask for much higher rates. So you probably all know this, right? Um, this term became popular a few years ago when people realized um, that all those uh, tiny niches which are look like located here in the long tail are really worth targeting. And the reason why I show you this is that whatever you, whatever you do, you already specialize in something, right? Whatever that is, you specialize in something. You do something well that few people in the, in the world do. And the long tail just tells um, that whatever this is, what you specialize in, whatever this is, it represents a niche, and that means there are a lot of people out there in the world who are interested in that. This is a quote from, this is a quote from uh, Chris Anderson, who is the editor-in-chief of Wired, uh, the Wired magazine. And I believe this is the guy who invented the term long tail, or maybe he just made it popular, I'm not sure. But he says that anybody writing, open so anybody writing software for anyone to consume for any reason, that is the long tail applied to open source. Open source is fundamentally a marketplace in which every, anyone can participate. And this guy said this in, 2000 and in, in early 2008, so that's almost four years ago, right? And he was talking about fucking SourceForge at that time. So today we have GitHub, and these are the only numbers I found, like this adds up to a million, uh, over a million repositories on GitHub, but when we ask for who is interested in your code, we won't look at the repository numbers, but at the, pull, at the, clone, the clone requests, right? I haven't been able to figure out those numbers, but they are obviously much higher than that. So maybe they are like a billion in total or something. Um, so when you, when you look back at, at this thing, then when this is a billion in total, then whatever tiny niche you have here, whatever you specialize in, there's a tons of, ton of interest there in the world. All right, and also he says, once again, we had that before, but he also says, open source is a more efficient way of discov discovering development talent rather than the old model of hiring out of universities and such. So he said, he said that from the standpoint of a person who is hiring, we don't need the universities, or maybe not that, but we, we need the open source and we look at open source. So, if you do not open source work, you should really consider getting into that. No matter what you're doing, you don't want to miss out on all of those opportunities. If you already do open source, you probably do want to do more. Just do this. I mean, as a developer, it's obvious, right? This is refactoring. You would refactor your life. Uh, it's, 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 it's easy. You can do that. Obviously, there are certain, certainly tons of reasons that, people, that hold people back from doing work on code in public. No matter what you think, people will be super happy for whatever tiny thing you contribute. People will be super happy and thankful when you join and try to help them with those open source projects. That will give you the opportunity to learn whatever you have to learn and get used to new things. If you think your English isn't good enough, it is. You guys should have met me four years ago. Your English is good enough. If you can talk, if you, can talk if, uh, if you do know a few words, it's good enough. Because the open source community doesn't fucking care about how good your English is. 
the open source community cares about your contributions, right? And if your English isn't good enough, they will help you, I promise. If you think you don't have enough time, all right. This is basically like saying, I don't have enough time to invest into my own future in all those amazing opportunities to get a double, to get a much higher rate. Obviously, that's your choice. I recommend you do. So, to me, open source is much more than just like a marketplace of good business opportunities. To me, open source is essentially a way of, way of life too. Because it enables you to focus your life on, on things that you love to do. And it allows you to focus on being happy and making other people happy as well. So, I think this sums it up open source feels good because it is good. And this was my talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Any questions? Or maybe anyone disagrees? Yes. It is. It absolutely is. So how much time do you have per week? Like, just say something conservative. How much time do you have per week? Four hours? Four or five hours. Four or five hours, that's a lot. You can <coughs> name any project you like. Which one is it? Do, w something you use every day. Is that Cucumber maybe, or Aspect, or Sinatra, or? Yeah, Rails is a rather big, huge project where a lot of people contribute. So maybe you would, you would want to pick something smaller that doesn't have a huge community already. That's a good thing, that's a good point. Okay. So do we have time for more questions at all? I have no, no idea what the time is. Oh, yeah, that's really hard to tell that in general, right? Um, I mean, you probably, you pro it's like open source, you can see open source as an investment in your team and an investment in your, also in your future code. So if you have like recurring pr uh, things where you work on, like projects that come up, maybe you, you're always in the social media space or something like that, right? Then your developers will be able to identify recurring things just make them extract that stuff and put it on, on GitHub, like that. And how much time that is really depends on the projects, right? I would recommend to, um, to be sure that your, your team gets used to it. They should really, you should put so much time into that that they get used to that. And maybe in the beginning it's a little bit more, just to overcome the, the barriers and that, like that. Maybe you would rather do it like one hour per day something like that, or maybe you just do a weekend and do it like a workshop, or it really depends. Um, I do nothing. <laughs> I mean, either, I, I mean, I have published quite an a big number of gems. And so your question is about how I deal with when I don't want to um, maintain them. 
I just do nothing. Because either this gem is worth being maintained, then some of those thousand people in the world will pick up this work, and I then immediately, okay, maybe that answer your question is be best. So if someone approaches me about a pull request and the pull request is good, I make him a collaborator right away. And so most of the time there are a few collaborators on my gems up when I don't want to work on that anymore and, I, and they will just merge the pull requests. And so it's a very smooth transition. I don't have to go, the, go out and, and announce, guys, I want to get rid of my gem, right? It, it was rather like people approach me and say, okay, we've noticed you're not doing anything anymore. So do, we, do you mind if we just merge the pull request for you? It's more like that. All right, so I've got. I just wanted to ask uh, uh, about, well, everything. Um, uh, if uh, you develop uh, open source and uh, if we all switch to open source uh, and developers will develop the code that will be a free, a freeware, uh, and uh, there will be nothing to sell, and so where will the money get from? Well, everything will be free. Ruby and Rails is open source, has been open source right from the beginning. And Basecamp is the product they sell very successfully. I think, I mean, you can, you can apply the same thing to basically everything, everything. Or do you, I mean. So uh, the main idea is to contribute, for example, into Rails, into framework, uh, um, uh, to have a name to build something great uh, with this framework and then sell it. You could do that. <laughs> Maybe I don't get your question. Um, <laughs> Basically, I just wanted to ask uh, if we, for example, all move to open source contribution, right? Then there will nobody to build any cool project. Yes, of course. <laughs> People will build software that others will use for free. And sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't want to say, my God, nobody build any private code anymore. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I mean, that might be a cool world, world where that works. We are probably it probably won't happen, right? We probably have to do work on, on private code as well in order to, get some, to, uh, to earn some money. There are very few, very lucky people in the world who can, just, who can work only for open source, right? But I do want to encourage you to do open source work because that will enable you to do less paid work because you can make more money from it then, right? So I have one more thing. Um, we have questions. More. You guys can always approach me after the keynote. I think I'm running out of time here. But you can. I'm, I'll be around, and you can always approach me after the keynote, of course. Uh, so we are at Ruby Shift, and you know we've seen that in the beginning there are quite some open source. Uh, maintainers around here and there are I mean there are really great names on, on the schedule and so that gives you guys the opportunity to approach them and ask them questions about how open source works for them and if you're on the other side working on open source already successfully please take your time and explain that to newcomers and if you're looking for help for your open source project, please announce that on the RubyShift hashtag. So let's please use the RubyShift hashtag as a channel for this kind of conversation. All right, so thanks a lot.